Okay, welcome everybody. I think we're gonna kick things off because we have a power hour here together to talk about mobilizing a movement of movements. Um, welcome, and this se session is being hosted by the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, my name's Charmian Love, and I've got the great privilege and pleasure of being an entrepreneur in residence at the School Center, where systems change is one of our very key focus areas. Now, we're joined today by a dream team of movement thinkers and practitioners, and together we're going to go through an hour of learning, sharing, and actually getting into some doing. Um, we have a very special activity, so I'd encourage everybody to stay on the line for the full hour, um, because you all are going to get a chance to become part of this Movement of Movements project. Um, now, to kick us off, I think we are lucky enough to have Sandy Hertz from the School Foundation with us today. Sandy, if you're there, can I turn it over to you to say a few words? Oh, perhaps Sandy hasn't been able to, to make it quite yet. Um, what we'll do is we'll turn it back over to Sandy when, when she joins. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe before we get going is set a little bit of context for where we're gonna go and, and who we're gonna talk to. I'm gonna start by introducing two of our amazing content um, practitioners and researchers who are gonna be a part of this conversation today. We're joined by Derek Feldman, who's an author and leading researcher on movements. There you go, Derek's got a big wave. Um, and he's also our partner at the School Center on the Movements of Movements Project. We're also joined by Farzana Khan. Uh, I don't know if I can see you on video yet, Farzana, but if you're there, maybe you can do a big wave. Um, Farzana is a writer, an organizer, and an award-winning cultural educator. So we're really lucky to have, again, a leading researcher and a leading uh, practitioner and doer on the line with us today to talk about this Movement of Movements project. Now, I think if I'm not mistaken, Sandy has joined us on the line. Sandy, can I turn it over to you to invite you to, to maybe share a couple of quick comments before we go into the content today? Thank you so much, Char. And yes, I am thrilled to be here. Um, I was totally taken in by uh, Peter Tufano and Paul Pullman's conversation and just dragged myself away, so I apologize I'm a minute late. Um, I am Sandy Hers. I'm on the Skoll Foundation team, and I have the privilege of working closely with the Skoll Center and with Char. Uh, I'm excited to join you on this event, which is part of our virtual Skoll World Forum week. Um, we, as you know, uh, usually hold the Skoll World Forum each spring in Oxford. It brings together more than 1,200 leaders from across the social entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and social change landscape for a week of learning and networking. And this year we had to cancel because of the coronavirus. Um, like many of you, our team is now working 100% remotely. We're finding new ways to balance work with the health of our families and communities and the health of the global community. Uh, this year, the forum's theme is collective strength. We thought there was no better way to reflect that theme than to have our global move, uh, network design and build a new forum week experience together. More than 80 organizations, and that's actually now up to more than 100 organizations, have contributed virtual events, and there have been more than 160 events added to the newly imagined forum taking place this week, including this one. Uh, to follow along, we're using the hashtag Skoll Goes Virtual, and we would love for you to do the same. Uh, in addition to dozens of independently hosted events taking place this week, we are also about to have uh, our Skull Awards ceremony today at 4 p.m. British Summer Time, uh, and uh, that's where we will reveal who our new Skull Awardees for Social Entrepreneurship are, and you can tune in at skull.org slash live. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to Shar, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sandy. And I promise you, we are going to run this session for one hour so that everyone <laughs> has time to go get their popcorn, go get whatever they need to sit in front and watch the award ceremony. I know I'm certainly going to be watching and I'm actually bringing my kids to watch it as well. So one of the great things is being able to open up these spaces and share the experience. I also just want to say a giant thank you um, to Sandy and the School Foundation. It is really great to be able to create sort of so many of these spaces for conversations to happen, especially in a time where we know collective strength is needed. So with deep gratitude. Um, and it's a beautiful segue to provide a little bit of scene setting to the Movement of Movements project. So before turning it over to Derek and to Farzana, what I wanted to do was just give you all a just quick overview of what we mean by mobilizing a Movement of Movements. Well, the premise of this project really is that today's problems are interconnected. 
And so that movements must find ways to join forces in order to solve them. Now, we started this project with a very simple hypothesis. There are many movements out there that share a similar goal. However, if we look at an adoption curve like the one that you can see on this slide, we know that many of them are still sort of in their early phases. And actually, one of the things we really need to be aware of is that they are on this pathway to try and figure out how they might engage mainstream audiences. But we also know that these movements on their own don't necessarily have the speed or velocity that exists that's needed in order to cross what they call the chasm, cross the chasm that exists on this journey to get to the mainstream. Now to cross that chasm, what we believe is that movements really have to find ways to come together to create a bridge across that chasm by finding ways to collaborate. And I'm gonna ask maybe if, if Derek could move it to the next slide, because actually put another way, when it comes to pulling on sort of these levers of systems change, we know that we will have more power if we coordinate and we all pull on those same levers at the same time, rather than just having one hand on that lever working on its own. So the Movement of Movements project is really about creating the tools and processes that are needed to create this collective strength, which Sandy mentioned. Now, for those that are interested, we have a full overview of the project itself on the School Center website, which includes our belief, our goals, our purpose, our intention. You can see it on this slide right here, but actually rather than reading it out, what I didn't do is encourage you all to, to check out the Movement of Movements website, which is connected to the School Center. Maybe we can plug it into the chat box. And obviously the invitation is open to all of you to find ways to engage in this project um, after this, this introductory call. But for now, I think it's time to go a little bit deeper. And so I would like to turn it over to Derek Feldman, who's gonna take us through a rapid fire overview of movement theory. Derek, over to you. Thanks so much, Shari, I appreciate it uh, as well. So welcome everybody, and I'm excited that you're joining uh, today. And as Shari mentioned, this is going to be a rapid fire conversation, uh, of course. And so as we go through here, know that there's so much more to understand about movements, but conceptually, at least for right now, I wanted to share some key movement principles for everybody that's joining us today. When we think about movements in general and how we have been studying these now, myself personally for more than a decade, um, when we look at how these movements design and develop, they kind of take two historical kind of approaches. The first approach tends to be in sort of the policy driven areas. And those are the kinds of movements that you might be used to. It covers things like stakeholder or legislative or even institutional as well. And and even for some movements, as we look at it, not just in policy, but also policy as it relates to companies and what they're doing inside. That's another sort of stakeholder environment. At the same time, we often see movements or in the cultural side of things, where we're trying to change the public's knowledge, attitude, and behavior. You might hear the words or acronyms KAB models uh, when people are going out and looking to design movements that not just inspire policy action, but change the behavior. And when we think about movements that are in each of those categories, know that they usually come to meet each other in what we would call sort of that moment of really big systems change as well. Because while policy movements can be effective in changing policy, it doesn't necessarily mean the behavior change happens in the general population as well. And so while you can have institutional change and hope that public participation change follows with it, it's not necessarily guaranteed. We see that with certain movements, especially in the cultural areas where you get into things like maybe policy related to human rights or anything else. You might have a policy, but not an enforcement of the policy. We may see that in certain instances like healthcare or anywhere else too. And so when we think about movements, we look at how those movements interact together, policy and then the cultural side too. Conceptually though, if we had to define a definition, and this is a working definition that we always look at, is essentially it is individually driven. It's individuals working together for the interest of a community as defined by them. And usually we look at the measurement of the movement's progress towards system change or social issue change in four categories overall. And I'm gonna cover those briefly and then turn it back over to Shar. So the first one is, how are they accomplishing milestones for the social issue? Um, while we all want to uh, have things change by 2030, 2040, 2050, we look at what the movement is able to progress in short-term milestones to lead to those larger system change elements. The other one is, is 
is that movement able, whether it's policy or cultural, able to recruit and drive public support for it? it means that we're starting to get the cultural policy awareness out there and starting to get it to from awareness adoption to then action and um, residual action after that too as well. And then of course it comes into the ability to pressure stakeholders. Do movements, are they effective in their pressure and putting the pressure on and supported by public and other entities to reinforce position uh, as well? And then lastly, are they effectively adding, in the end, this is about people, are they effectively able to deliver and bring in the real public voice? Even if you have a policy change, how do the beneficiaries of the social issue or the system, are their voice being heard within the movement? Are we able to communicate those things effectively? Now, if we break that down even further into these sort of categories, they're considered things like this. Essentially, accomplishment of milestones is an achievement metric uh, overall that we look at movements. The recruitment of the public is a growth metric, and we see how we can do it. That tends to be in the adoption phases too as well. The third is, is that when we look at the pressure and stakeholder, we look at levels of instigation. How does that level? Now, sometimes that instigation is as simple as you sharing a uh, a tweet or a post all the way to civil disruption. You know, those are scales which we're going to talk about. And of course, the last one, which is narrative adoption. Is the public, is the narrative that we're sharing conceptually overall in the movement, is that adoption truly happening from there too? And so when we look at those four things, I would say it's interesting to look at the measurement and scale of those overall. Now, when we think about that it means these achievement of the issue milestones in some categories in that sort of scale that I've been mentioning, it sometimes starts with individual achievement. That could be as simple as a person achieving something for the cancer movement by themselves, like a Relay for Life in the United States that does the American Cancer Society, to maybe smaller groups working on group achievement, veterans, and this could be employee groups, AT&T or global, uh, um, infrastructure workforce working for a social issue, self-organized, all the way to self-organized larger community achievement, such as the 5 for 15 global movement for $15 minimum wage or $15 or 15 um, base pay overall. So we lead with individual achievement among small peer, small group community organized to larger community organized environments. Each of these has their own achievement milestones and metrics. On the individual side, it tends to be something small um, in which that the person can at least contribute to something bigger. And as you go further, some of these goals tend to be much more, um, much more easily obtained. And there are some very clear uh, milestones that are ahead of them. In the growth phase and area, the scale looks very similar, but it kind of looks at it from the public adoption side, even in the institutional sense. You know, one of the ways that we look at it might be, can we make people more aware, at least taking a small action, Liberty in North Korea and doing uh, North Korean refugee resettlement, self-organized group action, campus environments with the one.org movements, or even when we look at larger and broader self-organized community actions, Surfrider Foundations in North America, and coastal grassroots organization that goes for victories. And they are growing by saying that we are a population of everyday people fighting for these certain victories. And they ask and invite surfers to the general public to come in and have that fight with them. And in the, la in the third scale, we look at it from the instig instigation side of things. Again, that's the cultural, economic, or social awareness building through the public action. But we are instigating the systems that are out there. And at school, center there's a lot of that systems thinking that's necessary to tie these movements together and now sometimes you might have uh, individuals who are doing private action giving philanthropically to try to support the systems to public action petition signing uh, that you might see with individuals like a like a uh, global citizen or group action as well like November all in the month of November their campaigns globally leading to nonviolent protests with say the Me Too movements and all the way into the civil disruption extinction rebellion and, and other kinds of areas these scales help us understand how the individual is placed within the movement and interacts against and with and for their fellow peers and colleagues within the movement and then the last one that I would say on our really brief journey through movement principles, which again is more than a probably a year long worth of study uh, together is the narrative adoption. 
are we starting to move so that when we see our metrics in the general public, have we changed attitudes, knowledge, and starting to see changes in behaviors as well? And while it might be general public, we can also look at it from, say, the corporate standpoint. Are corporations behaving differently based upon knowledge or attitudes related to, say, a climate change or climate action in general? And so when we think about narrative adoption, sometimes it's individually driven all the way up to sort of dominant localized narratives where we start to see policy and narrative change in pockets within countries and nationalities or in other kinds of communities too as well. The ability of the movement to spread a narrative and make it quite simple for others to adopt and see themselves within that narrative is something that we look at in everything from aided awareness, non-aided awareness metrics that are usually behind the scenes uh, in general. And so a couple things before I kind of turn it back over to my colleague here, because um, I know there's some other individuals that have got some really good things here, is that, that when we think about movements in general, we tend to see those policy and cultural. There's that interconnection that exists together. Those, we like to measure, and of course our measurements are consistently changing as moments happen culturally, politically, and socially, and heck, we're in a heck of a moment right now as we look at it. But all of those moments, we can try to see, one is what are the pressure points? How is the public adopting into it? Do we see the growth phase happening too? And what milestones are achieved towards the larger social issue change? So again, Hope, bear with me as I went through that quickly for you. Hopefully it gives you an idea of how we look at movements conceptually and where they go. Char, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Wow, what, wow, thank you, Derek. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the speed and the energy with so much incredible content. And I think, Derek, you, you said it well, it's a brief journey, which I feel like we've galloped through um, and you've covered off some incredible bases. I think what we should make sure we do is um, put maybe some links if people are interested in more around what Derek's doing and what his work is involved, sort of the longer journey beyond the sort of 10 minutes. Uh, we want to make sure you guys have resources that you can go through and learn more about some of these principles and themes that Derek has introduced. Um, you're getting a lot of positive feedback coming through here in the chat line, uh, Derek. Um, now, we, we've heard sort of these, these principles and we've heard these concepts and these frameworks that are being put in place. Um, we have a really special guest joining us today, uh, Farzana Khan, and we're so pleased, and I can see you on video now, thank you Farzana, uh, so pleased to have her join us because what Farzana is going to do is share her story, her experience as a movement practitioner, a movement maker, and, uh, and Farzana, it'd be great to hear you share a little bit about what your experience has been and where you see the importance of collaboration. So over to you, Farzana. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me. I, I want to begin just in, uh, from a space of gratitude. Um, so thanking Zainab for the work you've been doing in coordinating this. Also want to do a shout out to Baljeet Sandhu, who's now a visiting um, fellow at the Skoll Center and um, for also Skoll Center hosting the lived experience movement, um, which I'm part of, and I guess in some capacity um, also sharing from. I, to begin with, um, I think it's really important that I kind of establish ground. And um, before I kind of introduce myself and share kind of practice, um, I'd like to talk about the notion of equity since we want to frame this around collaboration. And what does it mean for me as a working class Muslim woman of color to share in the hierarchies of knowledge that we have, which is an academic, leading world academic institution, and what is the exchange that is equitable here. Um, and what I would suggest um, is honor the intellectual, spiritual, emotional labor um, that is being shared here. As Sarah Ahmed says, um, citation is, a fem is feminist memory. So if there are things that you're learning here, practices, um, that you're um, thinking to repurpose, then actually cite that and locate that. If you don't know, I'll put my email there so I can respond to you, but also where those ways of knowing and doing are coming from. Um, so it's not to reproduce the harms of knowledge production where we see the most visible or the most white or the most capable being um, the ones who are attributed as the people who are leading these conversations when actually the knowledge is coming from the margins. So really to create that knowledge transference and also to start building in cultures of equity. 
Um, so that's the space that I want to begin from and how can we make this exchange um, in that culture. Um, in terms of how I'm going to be speaking, um, uh, folks have been really generous and given me a bit more time. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to share a little bit about my background, but I think instead of saying what I do, maybe going into the principles of some of my work and practice. So the doing, doing the showing. Um, and I'll run through about 10 principles that I've drawn out over the last kind of 15 years that I've found have been really, really um, powerful and important um, in terms of the sustainability, but also the anti-oppression anti -oppression, oppression aspects of building movements, and also then what it means to be in partnership, in collaboration, and to also create um, a deeper sense of community as ways of being, not as just movement work else, you know, somewhere else. So um, in terms of myself, um, I really must also apologize. Derek, you had some really snazzy slides and I don't. Um, I've been um, organizing a lot around COVID-19 from on a grassroots level, from mutual aid to community care to much more policy level. So my capacity at the moment has been really re reduced. And I wanted to bring that in also to know um, how the relevance of the long-standing movement work um, that I and others have been part of is actually the solutions that the pandemic right now needs. The calls for how we want to live and move beyond the COVID um, situation requires the scale of change that some of the most um, uh, radical visions that are already existing have already been put out there, but they've been put out there by movement leaders, community leaders, people who are resisting and surviving. Um, and so, um, for myself, um, as Charmaine um, said, I, I have a cultural background, but my background um, started off when I was 14. I um, formed youth and community projects, which then I went on to become educational programs um, nationally and also internationally. I, uh, was, I ran a youth program called Voices That Shake, which supported hundreds of young movement makers um, that went on to do loads of incredible things but particularly around re issues of race uh, social justice class lgbtqi issues mental health all of those kinds of really pressing issues um in our society and what other kind of analysis and responses that are emerging from our lived experience and from our communities from then i i touched on equity um i founded an organization called healing justice london which really looks at public health and how community public health um, responses um, can lead to better public health provisions representing marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, and I'll put some links in so you can have a look. Um, and I think the other thing that I wanted to touch on and briefly mention here, and I've only really recently started talking about it, um, is Grenfell. Uh, when Grenfell happened, I led um, a lot of uh, the kind of external communications and strategized by being entrusted by the elders in the community. I am from East London and of course this happened in uh, West London and so as an ally to West London as someone who's been in movements I was entrusted to strategize and create the community-led external kind of communications and one of the reasons that I, I mentioned this is that I was in a role of an of an ally. My work was about being strategic, not about being visible. It was about, um, you know, how do I place myself, my teams, my networks, my resources um, that I've got and the communities that I have access to, to really um, do something that's effective, but not, not be, you know, visible or get to have a savior kind of complex around it or all of those kinds of dynamics. So it was really, it's only now in, in the light of COVID and Grenfell where the same skills of co mass coordination of strategic and multi-layered approaches um, that are needed, which are inclusive, which uh, come from a disability justice lens, which think about access, which think about trauma, which think about, um, you know, violence and visibility, all these different things. Um, is that methodology now again being reintroduced? Um, so yeah, I think those are, some of the things around me and um and i guess why i've been invited to speak here um and now what i'm going to do is run through these 10 principles um that i've 
I've kind of drawn out, but I, I also sit amongst the legacy of so many other people who have been doing this work and who might um, reframe it in a different way. But I found really helps inform the sustainability, but also the most liberating potential of movements. Um, and other movements use this work and this practice to build, um, and so the things like Wretch of the Earth um, have used some of this practice, London Leap, um, to kind of develop their work and their movements and movements of movements. Um, the position that I'm speaking from, because positionality is always important, is this concept that I talk, talk a lot about, which is our desire to be liberated and our desire to be free is actually about our proximity to truth. And so the first principle for me is who is the we in the movements? And the we always needs to be those that are on the front lines, those who are whose lived experiences um, speak to that, and also those who are, you know, most marginalized because they are the ones who reveal to us the reality of our of of what the situation is, the reality of our context, and also the legacies in which these things come from. One of the key things I found out from youth work is you'll never, and also from my own life, is that you'll never find anyone more creative and innovative than those that have had to survive the state and bypass it. And so, you know, while we don't want to put the onus of work on those that are on the margins, because this is why allyship is absolutely important. How does the operational, how does the background labor, the resourcing and um, the privileges, the networks, how does that all come from those with privilege? But in terms of who we're listening to, who we're led by, who we trust in, whose visions we want to realize and manifest, that needs to be not the mainstream. It needs to not be white. It needs to not be middle class. It needs to not be hetero and normative and male. It needs to be all of the bodies that are otherized because that's where we're going to find the most authentic, the most liberated, the most potentializing visions and um, that are already happening. They're not just visions, they're also realities because we have to do build those things, those alternatives in order to survive. So your who is absolutely important and who is leading and who is recognized and who is valued and what knowledge ways of knowing do you value and that not being centered just on academic statistics scientific knowledge but lived knowledge as the lived, uh, lived experience movement have done and Baljeet's work has really brought to um, light but also the um, the way that we um, bring solutions and practice to things and also our indigenous and spiritual and cultural traditions which help us navigate these moments um, and those are not found in western knowledge production and eurocentric knowledge productions because they still operate from the i think therefore i am as opposed to the decolonial we are so it is um, and so that for me the who is the we is principle number one principle number two for me is all the work has to move from a disability justice framework and be trauma informed. If you want to bring, um, if you want to really reflect the margins, those that are on the front lines, there is no other way. Our communities are disproportionately affected by trauma and our communities are disproportionately affected by chronic sickness and disability. Why I speak about disability justice in particular, um, I'm speaking from a lived experience perspective, but also because there are key principles in disability justice work which are essential for how we want to build. One is that we move at the slowest pace of our members. We, two, two is that we don't get to abandon ourselves. How we take care of the responsibility of our own lives, make sure our own needs are being met, is about accountability. And three, we don't get to abandon each other. And these notions of self and uh, collective abandonment and, um, and how we, and disposability, when we really incorporate disability justice, it goes beyond conversations of access and wheelchair venues. It really is about how do we all move together so no one is left behind. The same kinds of similar principles come in around trauma-informed um, at Healing Justice and Disability, um, Healing Justice London, disability and just, uh, justice and trauma-informed are central to our work. But where, why here I brought it in is that the work needs to be embodied. Right now we're in a pandemic that is showing up 
the chronic unsustainability of the social arrangements of our countries and the global order. What it's also showing is that our bodies have been brutalized and deeply industrialized. And that's what one of the things that we need to really be paying attention from, not just in, in terms of sickness um, and a pandemic, but just in terms of burnout culture, overwork, gendered violence, police brutality. So when you do trauma-informed work, what you realize is the body is a site of knowledge. The body is a way by which we connect and access each other and also know what, what, what human beings need to thrive and be well and healthy. And if your movements don't prioritize health and being healthy, they are inherently unsustainable. And if they don't understand what it means to dignify a body, especially bodies that have been marginalized and brutalized through colonialism and patriarchy, then it's inadequate. Point three, um, infrastructure. I'm zooming, trying to zoom through this while also giving it depth. Um, infrastructure. So um, movements need infrastructure. You need people to be allies who are doing the operational work um, and you need to have infrastructure that knows how to level power. You hear a lot of kind of movements will say, oh, we've got to level power down. But for me, what I found over the year, years is how do you level power up? If you've got people in your organization, in your collectives, in your movements that aren't being built up, that aren't being allowed and entrusted in leadership positions, then there's something wrong with that. Um, and what I would also say here is accountability. That um, and there's, I'm going to loop back to trauma informed because you can't actually, if you're not, you can't actually have accountability with with um, for people who are traumatized in, in situations of trauma. Um, and so the trauma informed work once one reinforces um, the accountability that we need, but then coming back to infrastructure, how does your infrastructure model accountability that is not punitive? And what I mean by that is it's not about punishing people. It's not about the prison industrial complex. And if you don't know how to deal with something, you get rid of it, but actually about, um, restoring agency about pathways and alternatives and options and choices and 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 that kind of uh, restorative justice model and and looking at how your organization creates space to have that accountability where people feel emboldened and empowered empowered isn't the right word but emboldened to be able to enact and hold people in the organization to account but also have feel that they they can engage in accountability without it being shameful or punitive but actually something that's contributing to the health of the movement um four there is gonna be leaders right and right now we need a lot of people looking at this pandemic and saying we don't know what to do no, there are people who know what to do. We're just not listening to those people. There are people and communities whose entire survival has been threatened over and over and over again. People who know what it means to survive. There, there's a wealth of disability justice movements. Of course, there are things unique to this moment, but actually in terms of the navigation tools, how we interimly move from one position to another to another, those kinds of skills exist. And, you know, often we hear, um, you know, we don't want the, the leader or the, the kind of one person um, icon and idol um, because actually the reality is real change happens with so many people, an entire constellation of people. So, yes, we want to dismantle insights of power, the, the icon, the idol, the leader, um, but in spaces where you're where there is um, a need for leadership, we want to build that in, in a rotary way, in a way that people can move into positions of power based on the appropriateness of their skills and their experiences, but also feel and have the emotional depth to know when to move back and create space for others and to be able to move in this dynamic way um, and see real changes as dynamic. I use a phrase a lot in my work, dynam discerning dy dyna dynamism, where what are the skills that you have to know what this moment needs and then how can you build a dynamic approach around that so it gets done. Um, whew, okay. Five, um, culture. Derek, I know you touched on this. So a lot of the times when we think we can't do something, it's because there's a poverty of um, imagination. Um, there's a poverty of imagination. So 
what we really need to be able to do is expand our imaginative landscapes and believe things are possible. And so the cultural work of broadening out and bringing into mainstream public consciousness becomes really important. And here is where the artists, the creatives, the people who are reconfiguring realities, who are designing new ways of being, need to have a really important role and should be uplifted and should be working side by side um, in our movements, but also the work of art as a thinking space not and as a site of knowledge needs to be reinstated as um in, in in our ways of knowing and our ways of knowledge production not as art as this thing that's like fun fun and netflix and chill but actually which is also important but actually these really concrete ways by which we access what we need to know um six um violence and visibility a lot of the people if you're trying to center the margins can't be visible there are yet if you try and search me from like two years till beyond you won't really find anything about me because i was you know i'm living under prevent um the de-radicalization program in a borough where people are heavily policed um and there's uh, heavy islamophobia so when i'm working with vulnerable communities i can't make myself visible so really understanding a lot of the times movements um and as part of corporate strategies think about brands and publicity to have mass attraction and mass appeal but real work and grassroots and frontline work often doesn't get to do that because it makes people vulnerable. So really understand the notions of surveillance and data capture and people's privacy and whose lives get made vulnerable when you um, have these kind of corporate brand strategies around mass movement. And this is where I would touch on Extinction Rebellion. The success of Extinction Rebellion is um, spoken about because it mass mobilized. Of course, it mass mobilized because it hinged on narratives that appeal to the mainstream. If it relied on the actual climate justice narratives that we have here in the UK, which are progressive and radical and bold and liberating, it would in, you know, think about state violence. It would think about migration and borders. And so we also have to see the critique that Extinction Rebellion faces, which is an appropriate critique as a mass mobilizer, is because it relied on a mainstream and appeal to the mainstream like the police, like uh, public institutions. Okay, seven, the redundancy. When we are building movements, we want to become redundant. The whole point of this work is that it shouldn't exist. So personally, if you're in a movement or supporting a movement, one of the key things that I ask people is, do you need to be needed? And if you need to be needed, then your orientation needs to change. You need to step back, move back, and take some time out from the work because the whole point is that we don't want to reinforce or reconfigure oppression, we want to be liberated from it. So really thinking about all your work as um, with the desire to end, the desire to have an end. And you know that's one of the things I take pride in, a lot of the work like Voices That Shake, which I built, it's its 10 year anniversary, but it's actually been rendered redundant now. The young people have built their own stuff that's so much better than what we could do. So really think about redundancy as a success measure in your work. Um, number eight, social skills. I'm gonna try and really zoom through this. Um, number eight is the social skills that we need. A lot of the times people think um, this work is about like, uh, particular activities or particular approaches. It's not about that, it's about who you are. So when I talk about liberation work, it's the daily habits, it's the practices. It, in order to do transformative things that are self-generating, that don't rely on the organization, that don't rely on the movement structure, it relies on us being able to have the social character and skills to know that. So a lot of you know organizations will say, how do we turn our organization into an anti-racist organization? Organizations are made up of people. How do you make your people anti-racist and know what to do in everyday circumstances? Because I can give you a list of do's and don'ts, but that won't make you competent in being able to navigate different circumstances. So actually, social skills around liberation and anti-oppression and disability justice and trauma should be part of all of our lives and all of our knowledge banks. Number nine, moving at the speed of trust. This is a phrase um, by Adrian Marie Brown and really I'm talking about pace. If we want to do deep systemic work a lot of the times there is immediate relief work that needs to happen but it, it needs to be paced it need it requires deep listening and it also needs 
space for people to deal and process. And sometimes frontline communities don't have that. So you as an ally should be trying to build that capacity, that space for rest, that space for taking on labor. And I want to also build, you know, um, the, or throw up um, the kind of throw up, throw out the the notion of crisis versus um, an urgency versus justice. Because so often when we move from a crisis space and an urgency space, we mitigate justice. And so thinking about pace and building capacity for those that really need it to be able to do the deliberative work that is needed for systemic change. And okay, so that takes us to 10. Joy, right. So liberation work. I'm a, a deep believer in pleasure activism. So what does that mean? It means the work of liberation practice should make us feel joy. We should desire to move towards radical positive possibilities. And we should know what that feels like. If we aren't feeling joy, if we don't know what it feels like to be well, to be good, and to feel good, to access intimacy and connection, then we don't know what it means to then have and sense and feel into those liberated those abundant worlds that we're all deserving of so joy is essential and um and creativity of course plays that part but yeah it's a non-negotiable for the health of organizations that is everything wow, wow. I, I am I, I, I am I'm so happy you ended on the the tenth point being joy because I certainly feel um, the the joy of the work that you do coming through and I just have to say I mean I've been taking notes across your ten points and I I'm so glad we've recorded this uh, I feel like each one of those points in themselves could be a whole session that we could run and and maybe we should consider that as a um, as a framework um, Farzana thank you for being so generous and so real and giving this work so much um, passion and for everything you've done. Um, again, I just feel like there's gonna be a lot for us all collectively to reflect on um, in your, your summarization of these principles. And I hope that this is just the beginning of a much longer conversation we can have together on, uh, on getting these principles more widely dispersed and so more people understand um, these incredible experiences and this leadership um, that you have been expressing. So thank you. Um, we're, we're at the stage in this, in this hour where we are going to now move into a bit of an activity. Um, it's a bit harder to be interactive when we have over 80 people <laughs> on, a, on a Zoom line. But we kind of thought it would be fun to start sharing with you all and inviting you all to be a part of um, the process of creating tools and capabilities um, that can enable movements to come together. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Derek um, to sort of provide a bit more of a, an overview of what we want to do in this sort of final 15 minutes together. Um, but before we do, I just want to, uh, again, say a giant thank you to Farzana. And, and I would encourage you to check out the chat box. There is a lot of really, really positive feedback coming through, Farzana, for your comments. And I think there's a lot of people that want to talk more deeply about these principles. So we'll hopefully take that forward. But Derek, over to you. Are you great to introduce our, our activity here for the rest of our time? Wonderful. Yes, Farzana, thank you so much. Uh, but, um, and so as we uh, talked about these movements and Farzana really applying that here, we went into um, we, at Movement of Movements with Shar and the School Center. And, and we kind of look at this from the perspective of how do we begin, especially in this moment, this COVID-19 moment that we're having this pandemic, to try to map some movements. Part of the movement of movements environment has been developing certain maps and resources and tools for those that are in the movement space. The redundancy piece that Farzana talked about really applies here. You know, we want to really help movements that are looking across many different potential areas and levers and so forth, which I'm going to get to you. In the movement of movements environment, we've, we've kind of worked through three different phases of work over, I'm sorry, three different large phases of work. Um, but uh, sub phases underneath each one of those. Essentially, we have been recruiting citizen researchers, individuals like yourselves that could be joining us to help to start gather movement data. Um, we want to take out the, this has to be a academic only or an applied research environment. We want, we are actually opening it up to anybody to assist in movement mapping environments 
for us specifically now um, when it comes to COVID-19 as well. As you see on your screen, essentially what we have been able to do across throughout the last year to two years has been going through each of these different steps to develop different movement maps from there. Um, whether it's related to climate action or now even on COVID-19, our, our opportunity here is let's figure out who is where and who is working on what, especially those levers, because we wanna add into those pressure points. Remember the pieces we talked about earlier when it comes to instigation and growth, we wanna make sure that our movements are adding value when it comes to the people that they bring to bring that public voice, that public, the real lived experience that Farzana talked about uh, too as well. So some examples of that work has actually led to some movements that you may see on the screen right now. This is climate action movements where we did a snapshot of those that are working for certain SDGs. This is a geographic focus. We even started to do different maps as it relates to the movement levers that they were that they were working on and specifically even some of the strategies. It gets kind of messy when you kind of look at it from this perspective. But two things are really important as you look at some of the movement mapping areas that we that we look at. One is, is that you'll see, even in a simple map like this, areas where so many are working on certain levers and so many others, let's look at the left-hand side or the right-hand, you know, there's so many areas of opportunity to as well, which is essentially where it kind of gets to the movement of movements environment that Shar was talking about. As we look at movements and we start to map and, and get to the data point, we kind of come at it from a layered perspective. Our first layer is, where is the area of focus and interconnectedness related to the issue? Once we sort of define that, we then get into what's their levers and model? What's that theory of change that they believe, that instigation model that we've been talking about, their approach to how they're engaging uh, the public and those pressure points and so forth? And then third, What's the structure and ecosystem they live in and interconnected when, with, with other movements in general? And so we take each one of those layers and begin our process. And essentially we're doing that for COVID-19 and want to invite you um, for that too as well. So in this first one, we have been taking um, some, of our, some of our sort of focus and areas from WEF, World Economic Forum. They have come out with a transformation map that's actually been quite useful. And uh, I'll share some links later on where you can access some of this. We just have to sign up um, freely uh, on it. Essentially, it's an interactive map that allows you to look at sort of COVID-19 from different areas and perspectives. And so one of the areas that we first look at specifically is in around the workforce and employment areas as it relates to COVID-19. Um, and one aspect in particular, which I'll show you later on, is sort of the social protection actions and policy areas. So what are employers doing, governments doing, movements doing to try to protect employees and employers, our employees um, during this time too as well. So that's an example of where we sort of hone in on an issue topic and focus area and then look at it from that first layer. The second thing, and this really comes from the work of the school center and the systems mapping work that is, um, that is being done in the focus there, is where are these levers? And we, we look at this and School Center looks at this from these sort of eight different levers, network and convening levers to research and movement and policy advocacy, as you can sort of see here. So our first one is let's look at the issue in sub areas. Our second layer that we get into is what are those levers? And Farzana's application of all of this, you know, if we had to put some headlines to that in a different way that we've been looking at, it's squarely within this. And in fact, it'd be probably good to take Farzana's words and apply that directly into here. So she'd really cued this up uh, as we look at successful movements too as well. So these are eight guiding levers. And of course, there's always the number nine, which is other, which, you know, those that tends to be in the innovation space. What are some unique ways that movements are coming in there that we haven't had yet to as well? And so when you even break it down further, sometimes we'll even uh, have these kinds of um, sub levers and theories of change as I see on the screen there. And in our movement of movements work, we've been actually mapping against these and the school centers now system mapping work too. And you can kind of look how we've even gone that step further. And so that leads us into our last layer, which is often covering these six major things, which is essentially the infrastructure, stakeholder engagement, target populations of work. Again, this kind of definitely gets into the, are we making sure that we're covering all public? And I use that word broadly so that we're not just covering aspects of the public or 
historical, typical majority of the public than rather than what's really needed. Theories of change, resource acquisition and use gets to Farzana's infrastructure piece and in getting those resources that were necessary. And so from that moment, we've created a, a movement mapping opportunity. When you may have joined early on, and I'll ask my colleagues at the School Center to put back up the, the link I shared at the beginning. And essentially what we did is we created a, a tool that we would love your participation and support in. Um, this is our movement mapping area. And I'm gonna actually switch to this screen and you're gonna see here that links the link that the school center is going to share with you via the um, via the chat is actually a link to this. These are resources that I just talked about that you can take a look at. Essentially, that movement mapping instrument tool looks very similar to this. And essentially, what we would love your participation if you want to volunteer your time and be a citizen researcher with us is we would love for you to help us map at least at the beginning stages some workforce development movements that are trying to do with that social protection areas um, within that uh, document you're going to see here that you have access to now you can actually access that movement and movement data entry link and that will take you to this actual link which is our movement and movement instrument that anybody can use and it looks at those different elements that i've walked through Remember the levers and all of the stuff that Farzana talked about. We've kind of put that, not exactly what Farzana said, but, it, but the larger headline levers and so forth are embedded within this work. And essentially, we would love your assistance and help in us mapping some movements over the course of the next two weeks. And out of today's work and those that join with us to try to map some COVID-19 movements, we're going to be producing a movement map and we'll give you credit for being one of our citizen researchers as part of that. So myself and Char and School Center will work together to design this map and distribute it as part of our togetherness as we work on to this movement of movements uh, collaborative together. And so you can go through the instrument together and, and um, we are obviously nearing our time here within the hour or the half hour. And I would say two things as you go through here is you can actually begin to enter your own information. We'll ask about who you are. If you want to even participate at higher levels, you can. And essentially what the result of your work will look something similar to um, some of this, and I'm going to show you that right now. Um, we've actually mapped three organizations, as you'll see on your screen right now, and essentially these three organizations are ones that are working immediately in this space. Um, Shar and I were connecting about what are some unique uh, movements that are out there, even the one on the top right is quite unique today, uh, too, as well. And so we begin to start mapping, and these are just three organizations, uh, movements that we're mapping in their work. We can start to see the different levers that they're going with so what this is kind of the result of all of that work put together and these are just three organizations uh here so here is sort of our our call and our, our call to action to you is not only um, click on the link that you see in the chat and join us we'd love for you to be a part of our collaborative wiki movement of movements and be a collective and citizen researcher with us and if you want to even do more you can in, you can email us uh email me here too as well and specifically the other opportunity that we would love um, for you to do too that might be quite interesting here is as you're going through there and you see unique levers right now that are in the moment being designed by movements that we haven't thought about even today as we get there because one of these one of the best exercises of the movement of movements work will be is that when we look across all of these movements that are mapped we're developing a, a study or at least a brief that shows what are the trends across all of the movements and what are some new levers we think right now is a moment where new levers are going to be created for movements and change and this is a this is a great uh, sense where we can lift up those that are using those new levers and transfer some of that knowledge across the system which is going to help us be much more effective in both our pressure instigation and those milestones that we want to reach together of course and so i hope that you'll join us um, in the movement of movements piece uh, together we shared a link in there and um, for those that do and contribute we're asking if you can map as many movements as you can for us over the next week and um, if you want to do even more please that'd be great and then in two weeks this collective body of work 
that you're participating in, we'll go to publish it and we'll make sure that you'll be one of the first to, to learn from it. So I thank you for, for sort of listening in and, and being a part of our movement and movements work. And I'm gonna turn it back to Shara to kind of close us out a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, what an incredible hour. We've covered so much ground. Um, and we've been keeping an eye on the chat function to look out for some questions. We've got a few minutes before we, we officially let everybody go and start popping their popcorn for the school um, celebration that happens at four o'clock. Um, but some of the questions that have come up, um, I, I just want to cover off really quickly. Um, we have questions about the recording. So yes, we are going to find ways of making sure we create a synthesis of this incredible feedback and, and get it to any of you that have, have logged on and registered for this through the Eventbrite. Um, we also have a question about geographic focus. Um, we didn't talk about this specifically as we were going through things, but this is a global program. So we absolutely want to make sure that we are pulling together movements for this particular challenge and sprint that, that um, Derek has mentioned, but all the movement and movements work, which are cutting across what's happening globally. So please, please um, help us make sure we are capturing as many of the important movement making and mobilization that's happening in regions wherever you are. We certainly want to make sure we are as global as we can be in, in developing this work. Um, I also have seen some of the points coming through about just really making sure we have ways of, of sharing slides and, and talking, Derek, there was a question in particular about um, the, the levels and the layers um, and having a bit more detail on them. And, and I guess what I would say is again, we, we wanted to, to provide as much as we could in an hour knowing we would never be able to do everything we needed to. Uh, but to the person who asked that question, um, what I would say is we, we can make sure we put some of that material which has more detail on those layers and those um, and those levers. That was another question that came through. Um, and, and I think probably the best way for us to do that would be to put it on the Movement and Movements website. So please uh, make sure you're coming back and, and checking in on, on that site and some of those additional materials we'll make sure we post. Um, I know we're coming up now very quickly to the, uh, to the, to the hour that we committed and, and that we uh, want to respect everyone's time. Um, so I think it, it just, it is upon me to really close us out with a massive round of gratitude. Um, I want to give a particular shout out to our incredible um, friends, fellow travelers and colleagues from the School Foundation and the School Center. So Sandy, uh, Lydia, who's been helping steer this ship, uh, Zainab, who was really involved in making sure we had the right content and the right uh, contributions in this discussion and is really leading on so much of the important systems change research at the School Center. Um, Zadir, Zadir, who's on the line as well, who's helping take notes. Um, I also want to make sure we have a massive thanks to both Derek and Farzana for so generously giving their time and sharing such incredible insight um, and, and connecting it to this bigger theme around collective strength. That is my final my, uh, comment of, of gratitude, which is to each and every single one of you that are on this line. Together we are so strong and if we can find ways to come together, work together, just imagine putting all of our hands on these levers and pulling at the same time, there is nothing that we cannot do. Um, when we are working together. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to be a part of this conversation. I hope it's the beginning of a journey and we hope to see you again at a future Movement of Movements project session. Uh, and please, please, please consider joining our citizen researcher team uh, by, by thinking about some of these really important tools um, and processes that Derek has introduced us to. If you have any questions, you've got our contact information. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a really wonderful rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thanks, everybody.